Yeah, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you uh, for the invitation. I hope you're all well and surviving Storm Barrow OK. Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a great opportunity. I'm thrilled to be presenting at your Theoretical Statistical Ecology seminar series. So thank you. As Blake said, my name is Chris Guyver and I'm, I'm an academic at Edinburgh Napier University. Um, as I say to my students when teaching online, if at any point I mute myself or stop sharing my screen, please let me know. And um, it's, it's done accidentally. So I give an outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about this recent paper, a switching feedback control approach for persistence of managed resources. And that's far too many words, so I'm just going to call that our switching paper for brevity. So this has been published earlier in 2021 in DCDSB. This is joint work with others. This is joint work with Daniel Franco Lees, who's at UNED in Madrid. That's Madrid's distance university. My PhD student, Phoebe Smith. I'm afraid I don't have a photograph of Phoebe. So this slide's not very diverse, I'm afraid. Um, uh, my PhD student, Phoebe Smith, and my postdoctoral supervisor, former Stuart Townley, who's the chap on the right. So to give an outline up front of what we do, this is all theoretical work. And broadly, we use tools from mathematical control theory. So what I mean by that is deterministic modeling plus measurements, real world measurements from some process to propose a solution to a problem in theoretical ecology, particular problem, which is robustly conserving a population of interest where what you're doing, you're not sure of its effects. The effects of control are uncertain. So I want to, um, to sort of motivate this problem, I'm going to give some background and context to the area of kind of mathematical control theory in biology and theoretical ecology. Um, if much of this second, this item two might be known to you, so I apologise if it's sort of repetitive, but hopefully there are some sort of new ideas or new perspectives. A bit about me, um, Blake's actually already said a lot of this. Um, I thought I'd introduce myself. Uh, I'm probably not that well known to this audience, but I, on reflection, I realised I partly included this slide to partly address my own sense of imposter syndrome, which is that I'm presenting to a theoretical statistical ecology seminar, but I'm a mathematician by training. So uh, first degree PhD 2008 and 12, respectively. Um, I've had some academic experience at both Bath and now I'm at Napier. And I'm a mathematician by background, but with this interest in math control theory and certainly in UK higher education, this sits somewhere between maths and engineering. So it's not quite clear where I belong, right? Do I belong in a math department? Do I belong in an engineering school? But my journey into um, developing or applying these ideas in theoretical ecology started from postdoctoral research um, and I sort of continued since really. So I have no formal training in ecology. There are large gaps in my knowledge. The experience I have, I've picked up from working with theoretical ecologists. A bit more scene setting. I was a researcher, postdoctoral researcher on a UK funded Research Council funded project with Stuart Townley. So in the top left here, this is a, one of his slides from a presentation many years ago. And this project, his project, was about using ideas from mathematical control theory, particularly to better predict biological invasion. So lots of the ideas um, that we currently have date back to this sort of collaboration. So next to Stuart Townley is the chap in the, I don't know if you see my pointer, the chap in the hoodie. Uh, that's Dave Hodgson. He's a theoretical ecologist at the University of Exeter. There's a much younger version of me. <laughs> nice to see you. And this woman in the bottom right is Brigitte Ten Humberg. She's a theoretical ecologist that Lincoln University of Nebraska, Lincoln, the State University of um, Nebraska. And she is also a theoretical ecologist. So our connections to ecology are really through these academics. We sort of and interdisciplinary collaboration with them. <clears throat> OK. So I, as I say, I begin with a few slides on what I understand by mathematical control theory and then move to its connections to theoretical ecology and biology. So system theory, I would say, is the mathematical framework for interconnecting dynamical objects. Being a bit vague about what dynamical objects are, things which change with time. So they could be specified by differential equations or difference equations or something else. And then control theory is a kind of very broad discipline from a practical end through to a theoretical end, which focuses on the design and synthesis of controllers in causal dynamical systems to do something, to achieve some desired dynamic behaviour. So combined, I would argue this is the mathematical language for describing and abstracting feedback. And these block diagrams, these sort of pictures are often used in the, the context of systems and control theory. So I talk you through this diagram. So it is the interconnection of two objects like P and C, traditionally P for plants, not as in a 
an animal or a plant, but a plant is in a power plant or a chemical plant or something, and C for controller. And associated with the plant <coughs> is some performance, which is some derived quantity from the plant, which you would like to do something. To affect that, you take measurements or measurements are available of the process, the plant. They might be noisy. They might be subject to disturbances. They are then fed into the controller, which might be physical or virtual. It might be a physical thing or it might be a, a model to produce a control. That control is then fed back into the plant in order to try and make your performance do what you want it to do. So, for example, if both P and C are specified by differential equations, when you connect them, you end up with a big differential equation. So in order to shape behaviour, you need to understand it first. And that's what makes the discipline quite mathematical, I'd say. So you need to understand behaviour in order to subsequently shape behaviour. So, again, as I understand the history, the principles of control theory trace their roots back to the Industrial Revolution and things like flywheel governors for for regulating steam pressure in engines to facilitate industrialization. And modern control theory was sort of formalized across the 20th century, things like radio engineering and aircraft autopilots. <clears throat> now, arguably, I think um, control theory is often seen as an engineering discipline. So if you'd asked me a number of years ago what a feedback system was, I would have said central heating, right? You know, your thermostat controls your radiators, which controls the temperature of your room and the process can, continues. It's all very dull and boring. But there are, there are many, many connections to biology and ecology, which I'll seek to elucidate. <coughs> it's also worth noting at this point that this, this diagram is quite general. Lots of problems fit into this setting. On the one hand, that's a really good thing because it's creative, right? It allows you to apply, it's transferable. You can apply your knowledge in a whole different setting, work with whole different groups of people. You know, it, it, I find that interesting and stimulating. So not all of my work back to my imposter syndrome is in kind of theoretical ecology. The downside of this is that control is actually rarely the main event. It's often in the background, sort of supporting something else doing its thing. So the analogy I tend to use is with AV, audiovisual. You know, if you go to the theatre or something, or when we used to go to the theatre, perhaps, you know, if the lighting and sound works fine, you don't really credit it. If the lighting and sound breaks, someone's microphone works or something, you think, oh, you know, the AV's failed, like someone should get sacked or something. So it's a bit of a tricky position to be in. It also often doesn't have the limelight because you are helping something else do its thing. Now, this diagram, control theory is now a really mature subject, and there are many facets to the diagram, right? Both P and C themselves might be um, comprised more smaller systems, right? They, they themselves might be the interconnection of block diagrams. And for example, it's mature because there are a number of technical settings. So you may assume that P and C are linear or nonlinear. You might assume that they're modeled continuously in time or discreetly in time. They could be deterministic or stochastic. They could be finite dimensional, meaning differential equations or infinite dimensional, partial differential equations and so on. And the list goes on. There are also some philosophical distinctions as well, which I won't really dwell on, but just to make you aware of. When we think of inputs and outputs, it's tempting to think of a causal relationship. Inputs cause outputs, but often things like currents and voltage pairs occur kind of simultaneously. It's not clear that there's a causal relationship between them, and that affects how you view the subject and you know what tools and so on you use. One distinction I particularly like to draw upon or highlight in the current context of ecology is the distinction between optimal control and robust control. <coughs> so I've drawn again my block diagram. I've made it a bit more mathematical with some symbols. Now I have P, but this belongs to some set pi. I have C and together they give me sigma. So optimal control, now I want to choose C so that some desired dynamic behavior is achieved, but also I want to minimize some functional, some prescribed cost functional, minimize, maximize, it doesn't matter. So this is you know, doing something as quickly as possible or as cheaply as possible or maximizing some yield, right? optimal control. Optimal control and robust control sit at the other end, uh, opposite ends of a spectrum. Robust control refers to the, the fact now that you might not know P and you only know that P belongs to some bigger class Pi. And so you'd say that something is robustly stable if, if Sigma is stable for all possible P in Pi. And then the bigger Pi gets in some sense, the more robust your result is. And 
I, you know, only when I started thinking about this and you see the quote at the bottom, controlling something you don't know very well is challenging, right? Because <laughs> you, you have less to work with. You know less about your model, the less about the thing you're trying to do. And I'll mention this a bit later, but optimal controls tend not to work very well on models that they don't know, right? So, so things which are optimal, they are really at other opposite ends of a spectrum, I'd say. OK, well, I'll, I'll get back to that a bit later. <clears throat> OK, that concludes my brief summary of what I think of as mathematical control theory. I'll now try and make some connections to sort of mathematical biology and theoretical ecology. So arguably, there are sort of two obvious connections and they're described one and two. The first is that many biological systems are described by dynamical objects and you study them because you'd like to affect a change in their behaviour. So, for example, epidemiological models, right? You might have a vaccination strategy, you might have a quarantine strategy, you might have some other kind of intervention strategy. And you'd like to know how to design it in order to achieve something, be it reduce infections or something. Yeah, I've spent a bit of work time thinking about pest control. So you have a crop, <coughs> it's being consumed by a pest. That obviously diminishes your yield, which is not good from a food security perspective. So, OK, so, so how do you deal with that? And then what I'll be speaking about today is sort of conservation, so kind of population management. So given that control theory is trying to achieve desired dynamic behaviour, it's the kind of useful language to tackle these problems with. The second point is subtler, but all equally important, I'd say. And this is the idea of modularity and subsystems. So many biological systems themselves are the arrangement and combination of subsystems, quite often across scales. So the human body is organised into cells, tissues and organs. Ecosystems can be organised by species, by trophic level, by functional trait, by biomass, say. And, and systems theory, as a, as a language for understanding how these things are interconnected, can offer descriptions and explanations of complex biological phenomena, I'd say. So this isn't my own view, or this isn't only my own view. Other people have noted this as well. So this is a nice quote from The Way Life Works by Hoagland and Dodson. And arguably, if we think of feedback, I often think of it as an engineering principle, yeah, my central heating system. But arguably, it was a biological process before it was an engineering one. So feedback is a central feature of life. The process of feedback governs how we grow, respond to stress, challenge, and regulates factors at body temperature such as body temperature, pressure and cholesterol and so on. So, so others have noticed the kind of centrality of feedback in biology. And OK, everywhere I say natural selection. So this was a, based on a slide I presented to students. I'm guess for this audience, I probably don't need to include this definition of natural selection, but there's random mutations in genotype which lead to a change in fitness and fitter things survive, right? Less fit things don't survive. And Alfred Rus Russell Wallace, a Wallace in uh, 1858, so he's a peer or a contemporary of Charles Darwin, made this observation connecting natural selection to feedback. And if you take nothing else away from this talk, at least take this remarkable quote, because this is a powerful observation. So The Origin of Species was only published in 1859, so this is about the same time. He's noting that natural selection acts like a feedback regulating mechanism because deviations from um, good fitness can't survive. It's yeah, it's a very powerful observation. Okay. More recent connections in the academic literature. I've I've listed some or I've shown some here. I wanted to include some figures to kind of break up the text on my slide. That's why I include images this way. So there are some nice reviews. There are some nice perspective pieces. I thoroughly recommend them. This this paper in the top left is really well written. It's really clear. It's nothing to do with me. No, I'm not on. I'm not an author. Um, I, I recommend it as a sort of recognizing the role of feedback control and control theory in biology. The two papers on the right are more related to the control of control in the context of ecosystems and ecosystem management. And this paper in the bottom left is, is quite interesting. It's from 1975, so it's quite old now. And it's not very well cited, which suggests that the ideas didn't really catch on. Systems identification is the control, as I understand, the control term for learning models, right? For fitting and verifying and validating models. So that's a statistical discipline as well, right? How do you bit models to data. So uh, Halfon in 1975 was thinking about these ideas in the context of ecosystem models. And um, OK, so I've listed four papers here. I, I think the re real recognition that feedback is a regulatory mechanism and you have these modular systems very much present in biology. 
Okay, I've got this final bullet point here that mentioned in passing this separate discipline of adaptive management. This is a whole other discipline, adaptive management. As I understand, it's broadly resource management using feedback. And it's a discipline I don't know very much about. This was sort of, they're big enough that they do their own thing, but yet there's a sort of another connection between control and, and managing ecological quantities. Okay. So from a slightly different question is why is investigating the connection between math control theory and sort of theoretical ecology, why is it interesting and challenging? Well, this is a subjective question, of course, and your answer depends on your perspective. I would argue that there are three kind of key features of ecological models, or at least meaningful ecological models. They're non-linear, typically. They're positive dynamical systems because they refer to naturally non-negative quantities. And deterministic models are often crude because they come from parameterized, they come from param, para, yeah, para, <laughs> they come from data, I'll just leave that word out. And they're not based on physical laws. We don't have Kirchhoff's laws or Newton's laws in ecological settings. So robustness considerations are essential, right? Your models are likely to be poor or not great. So traditionally, control theory has been designed in the context of general linear systems. Now, that's not quite true because lots of people have worked on nonlinear systems and positive control systems, positive control theory. These are now nowadays really well studied areas. But the point I'm trying to make is that off the shelf solutions for using control in ecology aren't always available or suitable because they've not been set up to consider the fact that they're nonlinear. They're positive models and robustness is essential. So developing control in these in this context is, is interesting and challenging, I'd say. Okay. The current emphasis of the work with that me and Phoebe and others is on robust control rather than optimal control. And the motivation I think for this is twofold. The first is there's lots of literature focusing on optimal control in biology ecology. It's not very scientific or objective, but if you just type optimal control biology into Google Scholar or similar, you get a lot of returns. And, and, and then the kind of, I guess the reason for that is sort of clear, that if you can do something optimally, that's a good thing. You know, resources are finite and precious. If you can minimize some quantity or maximize some quantity, why, why wouldn't you? So, you know, that's a crowded area. I'm not sure what we could add to that. That's, but robustness is rarely addressed, I'd argue. Yet it's given, it's important given the problems of the known problems of optimal control in uncertain environments. So you can use simple verbal models to explore this. Like imagine catching a train, right? And imagine your goal is to catch your train, but for wait for as little time as possible, because waiting's boring. So how do you do that? Well, if your station is 10 minutes away, you leave nine minutes, uh, sorry, you only leave 10 minutes or 11 minutes to get there. You don't have to wait very long. But that's not very robust because if in fact you you get delayed for some reason, you know, you meet somebody you want to talk to or your taxi is delayed or your bus is in traffic, you miss your train. So a more robust solution is where you leave 20 minutes or 40 minutes or whatever, but then you've spent a lot of time waiting at the station, which perhaps you needn't have waited. So that's a sort of simple verbal analogy, but it highlights the differences between robustness and optimality. Something which is optimal need not be robust and vice versa. Now, ultimately, what we'd like to do is combine the best of optimal and robust control, trade these off against one another. But we're not we're not there yet, I would say. So. The main focus of this talk is going to be an example of sort of area one, right, using control to achieve some desired dynamic behavior. But I highlighted the second area as well, which was using control or ideas from control to offer insight. So I highlight two bits of work. I'm sort of plugging my own work at this point. I highlight two bits of work I've sort of done in this direction, these papers A and B. So in paper A, we're, we look at ideas from switched um, control systems. Uh, so multiple modes of operation, particularly commonly apinor functions uh, in the context of predicting growth in spatially structured populations. So we're not particularly manipulating that population. We're just trying to add some insight into when something does or does not happen. And then paper B, OK, biological invasion, kind of exp ex invasion exponents and these sorts of things. Here we use ideas from positive control theory in the context of trying to predict, better predict when biological invasion may or may not be successful. So. A summary of so far, I've spoken about systems and control theory as I understand the discipline. And so understanding and consequently shaping Internet interconnected dynamical systems. And I've sought to elucidate and motivate the connections to mathematical biology and ecology. 
And I've made this emphasis, this distinction between robust and optimal control. Okay. So I'm now going to talk about this switching paper. So I'll introduce the problem, its solution, and then some commentary on what we do. So this is largely driven by Phoebe. Um, I did invite Phoebe to this talk. I'm not sure if she's here. Um, I'd like to promote her work, that's all basically. She's interested in exploring the use and utility of tools from math control theory in the context of conservation of migratory species. So obviously there's a spatial extent to this because they're migratory. So here, present work, we sought to use ideas from so-called simple adaptive control theory for resource management. Now resource management is a particularly dry term. What I'm referring to is something which is non-negative, naturally non-negative, and it changes over time. So a population is an obvious example of that, but there might be others, hence resource management. But for this present seminar, I'm thinking of populations. And the present problem is how to ensure persistence of a dynamic quantity with a fixed number of discrete control strategies when you don't, you're not certain what these control strategies do. There's a bit more to it than that. But that's essentially the essence of the problem. So persistence is a mathematical term, but its meaning coincides with its sort of common use meaning, right? Which is the idea of persisting or not, not disappearing. Persistence is now a really well studied area in mathematical biology, I'd say. So this is a textbook or um, by Hal Smith and Horst Thiemer. These are really big fish in math bio, I'd say. They're kind of dynamical systems experts. They work on tough stuff, basically. And I've included a quote from this, right? Mathematically simple speaking, in its simplest formulation, um, we want the limit of something to be positive. So it might fluctuate, it might be oscillating, but we want it to be bigger than zero. It's kind of at the heart of what we mean by persistence. Okay, but also from a stochastic perspective, persistence is well studied. So this is a review paper, it's about 10 years old now, um, by Sebastian Schreiber, who's at UC Davis, who's a, again a sort of theoretical biologist, ecologist come sort of um, mathematician, I'd say. And I've quoted the paper at the bottom line here. In contrast, persistence requires the X of T, so something like a Markov process or something, tends to be repelled by some extinction set. So an idea of avoiding zero or avoiding some extinction set. Hey, so I recall the problem, how to ensure persistence of a dynamic quantity with a fixed number of discrete, discrete control strategies when the effect of these strategies is uncertain, assuming that we can take measurements. Right? We are assuming that we have access to some information and that's regular measurements of the quantity. So we want to use feedback control. So for that, measurements are essential. Right? And we want to choose a strategy, assuming that at least one of them work. Right? We'll get, I'll, I'll get on to that. But I just want to note here that we're not claiming this is the only solution to the problem. There are others, and once you've seen our solution, you can compare them, right? So for example, one possible solution is just learn your model better, right? Do some more sort of systems identification or model fitting, have more confidence over what your model does. To state the problem mathematically, we are going to let the quantity of interest to our population, we'll denote it X of T, it varies in time with some discrete time step T. So it's scalar or vector valued, it could be structured and it's naturally non-negative. So an opportunity to include more pictures. Um, vector structure captures distinct de developmental stages, right? Such as insect instars, or I've included some nice pictures here. And it, it kind of captures a richness which you don't see in scalar models because transient dynamics and so on can really play a role with stage structured models. Also in the context of sort of measurement, you might only be able to measure certain stage classes. So for example, pelagic species such as big sea turtles and so on, measuring them at sea is very difficult, right? You tend to only census them when they come to nest. So, so different life stages can only be sampled at different, um, well, different life stages can be sampled or not. Okay, so we've got two integer Q distinct fixed control strategies, and we can choose which one we apply, which one we play at a given time, and we can change, we can change them if we wish. So this leads to a model for X. So it's a discrete time model of switched positive difference equations. So difference equations because discrete in time, so that's, that's some fixed time step. H is the first argument of the function F, that determines which of the strategies is being applied. And then the, 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 the map F as a second function of its second variable describes the dynamics of X. 
So it maps the non-negative orthant to itself. So the non-negative orthant's invariant. So solutions which start non-negative stay non-negative. They bounce around that orthant. And we're going to assume that f of zero is zero for every strategy, which basically corresponds to extinction or absence. So we don't know these f, right? That's the key idea. We're assuming that they're there from a robust control perspective, but we don't know them. Because clearly, if you knew them, you just pick the one that was best, right? <laughs> you, know, you just look at them and say, well, this one has nice dynamics. This one doesn't have nice dynamics. So that's an obvious that we're not assuming that solution is not available. So in particular, you can't just iterate this. X is not known with certainty. So you, you might say, well, what sort of control does that kind of correspond to? And I'd argue that this is kind of qualitative things where it's quite hard to say what the quantitative effect is. So suppose you reduce poaching. OK, it's a good thing to do, say, if you're trying to conserve something. But how exactly that affects the model might not be clear. Or you might run some public awareness campaign or you might improve fertility. These are all qualitative descriptions of control you might try without saying quantitatively what they do. We are going to assume that a measured variable is available. So this is y is c times x. This is a linear function of x. So as I say, it might just be one or two stage classes. It need not be the whole state. And notice there's no measurement error at this point, which is highly idealized, right? If you measure something in, in, in ecology, chances are you make a mistake, you, you miss something perhaps. So that will come later. But we're going to prepare, we're going to propose a so-called adaptive switching feedback control scheme. So I need to prepare the way. I need a few ingredients. So I'll talk about those now. The first thing I need is a fixed sequence tau of positive numbers with a particular property. And I want their quotient to diverge. I want their quotient to get bigger and bigger. So asymptotically, what this means is tau grows faster than exponentially. So tau could be like tau j plus one is tau squared. If you start writing what that down is and start positive, that grows very quickly, faster than exponentially. And I also need what's called a switching function. And this is a function which turns a non-negative variable, so R plus, a non-negative variable, into one of my strategies. And the way it works is most easily seen in this diagram. I look at tau intervals. I'm going to call the difference between two taus a tau interval. So I look at the first tau interval. If my argument of k is in that interval, then I apply the first strategy. If I'm in the second tau interval, I apply the second strategy. And then I use modular arithmetic, right? So after my q strategies, I just wrap around and go back to one again. So, so this, this takes, so I go one, two, three, four, and then so q must be bigger than four. And then at some point I just start again. And notice that these intervals, these tau intervals are getting bigger. And they're getting bigger in a particular way. They're getting bigger faster than exponentially. And that's gonna be important. So these things are in the background and they're fixed. They're choices, but they're fixed. Okay. So this is the kind of main model that we, you'll see this a lot. I'll talk about it. This is, we call this an adaptive switching feedback control scheme. The first equation is my model for X. But whereas I previously had a fixed strategy H, now my strategy can change, right? It depends on K, it depends on T, there's a T in there. And S, this variable S is new, it's a control variable, and it's called the switching sequence. So it's a variable which doesn't get smaller. It's a non it's a non-negative number and it's only getting bigger or constant. And the idea is, is that I try strategy K, K of S of T, and then I change it if I need to. So notice that when Y is small, Y is your measured variable, when Y is small, one over y is big, and so s gets bigger. When y is big, bigger than some threshold m, I don't change s, it just stays as what it was. So let the, the outline of the strategy is kind of written verbally here. You apply your strategy, k of s of t, to your to x. That gives to so that gives, that's the first equation. And then you run this on and you see what happens. If your measurement gets small, then S increases. And actually it increases rapidly because one over Y becomes big. This will get S, make, make S bigger. And at some point it will jump into another tau interval. Now it might skip some, but it will jump into, it must fall in one of the tau intervals. Okay, now K changes. And now I choose a different strategy. Okay, it might be the next one or it might be some later one, depending on if I missed some gaps. That gives me new dynamics for X, right? Because I'm using a different strategy. I've switched onto a different strategy. 
And then as y gets large, hopefully it does. Well, if y gets large, at some point it's bigger than m. OK, at that point, I no longer update s. s is, st plus 1 is just s, so s is constant. In particular, it converges. And if y stay large, well, there's no further switching, and we're done. That's what we'd like to happen, basically. That's the kind of idea of this scheme. So I include the model again. So I, know, I make the comment here that theoretically, this is straightforward to implement. You need to measure y, you compute s, and then you compute your new strategy. So there's no optimization procedure to perform or anything. Now, I'm not against optimization procedures. I don't want to sound sort of like um, uh, against them. I just think I'm trying to highlight that this is a benefit of this scheme is it's really quite easy to kind of implement. You just pocket calculator, really. And the ideas really are behind from adaptive control, I'd say. So I repeat my model, we repeated it several times. In adaptive control, you're seeking to stabilize zero, send things to zero, make zero stable. Persistence can be viewed as destabilizing zero, making zero repelling, right? I want things to send things away from zero. So this, I'm not gonna give the proofs of any theorems, but these are the kind of main ideas behind them. If your dynamics change exponentially, then they can only take place in tau intervals. Sorry, start again. Exponential dynamics can take place in tau intervals because tau is growing faster than exponentially. So the model can do its thing in a tau interval if the tau interval is big enough. And then that's one observation. The second is that positive systems, a nice property of working with them is you can typically bound their states from above and below. And it's the bounds from below which really matter. So um, if y of t is, well, I have to get my inequalities right around, bigger than or equal to some quantity, then 1 over y of t is less than or equal to some quantity. And that plays kind of a key role in updating this, in estimating s, basically. So, so far, I haven't placed any assumptions on f, right? I've told you what I'd like this scheme to do, but we haven't assumed, made any assumptions on f, and we haven't made any assumptions on y, the measurements. So the questions become, for which f and which measurements does this scheme behave as you would like it to? And ideally, as I say, we, we don't want to know what f is. But, well, if we knew what f is, we'd have a different solution to the problem, right? So we want hypotheses which do not require explicit knowledge of f. So the first class of models we consider are linear models, right? So now I just have q matrices. They're unknown, they're non-negative. And my, my model f of h times x is I just pick the h matrix and I multiply it by x. So this leads to linear difference equations, right? Very straightforward models. And so we make some assumptions. I need the AH to be irreducible. This is a structural assumption. This is reasonable in ecological examples. It means you haven't got any senescent life stages. Essentially, the associated like life cycle graph is strongly connected. You can get from every stage to every other stage. You haven't got any other sort of absorbing states or anything. And then these models should either decline or grow. And you need at least one to grow. So this is what we mean here by a persistent strategy. If none of your strategies lead to growth, then you can't expect the overall model to lead to growth. You need to know at least one of them will give you growth. And then we have to have some coupling condition between the measurements and the dynamics. And I won't go into that here, I've decided. If you're interested, please look at the paper or ask. But there is a coupling condition between what you measure and the models. So I, I said earlier in my spiel that linear models allow, um, you know, linear models aren't that realistic in ecology. That's true. They allow for unbounded exponential growth. But they serve as a starting point to illustrate ideas. So I think that's the value in studying them particularly. So these are, these are the sort of results we get. This is our first main result. Consider the adaptive, well, it shouldn't be then, sorry. Consider the adaptive pitching, switching feedback control scheme above assumptions. As long as I don't start at zero, if I start at zero, I stay at zero, so that's not very interesting. As long as I don't start at zero, my switching sequence converges. My switching function converges to a persistent strategy and X diverges. So in particular, this scheme guarantees persistence. And a persistent strategy is identified. It finds the one or a one which works. There might be more than one. And we've excluded this kind of threshold case where the spectral radius is one. Rho is spectral radius, by the way, dominant eigenvalue, um, which corresponds to asymptotic stasis. 
that simplifies the analysis. It can be included, but we've excluded it for now. So notice this is an asymptotic result. It tells you about what happens after large time. Clearly, in conservation, transient behavior would be really, really important. So I'll, I'll say something a bit more about that later. And so you've got some parameters to choose, right? You've got some design terms. There's this switching sequence tau, well, sorry, there's this underlying sequence tau, there's your initial S and your threshold N. And the, the theorem is true for any of these values, but as you can expect, the performance depends qualitatively on how you choose them. Okay. So I'm now going to present more or less the same result, but for a class of nonlinear models, which, as I said, are much more biologically um, meaningful and relevant. So these are sometimes called density dependent, nonlinear models, and we take a particular form. So if you're familiar with control theory, you may well recognize these. They're called Lure systems. Lure is an anglicization of a Soviet scholar. There are others in the in the literature. So now this is you can view this as it has a linear part and a structured nonlinear part. So like, oh, crumbs, sorry. Uh, like a rank one, a nonlinear rank one perturbation. So it's a class of nonlinear models. So I have some matrices A, H, some vectors B and F, H, and some functions G, H. So again, I get some um, nonlinear models of this particular form. But notice that this does include scalar maps. So if you're just interested in scalar um, difference equations, they're included by making certain choices of A, B, and F, and G. And essentially, we assume that these models in isolation are either globally exponentially stable or they persist. That's that, that there are kind of two situations, and at least one of them should persist. Now, um, there is a nice there are nice ecological interpretations of these types of models. So I recommend the work of Eric Eager. I've highlighted one of his papers here. Who's made he's a math biologist. He's made nice connections of interpreting these models in the ecological setting. So typically, they have both a linear component and a nonlinear component. The linear component captures things like survival and movement between stage classes. These are often assumed to be density independent processes. Recruitment is often assumed to be density dependent, and that can be captured by this nonlinear term. So this vector B structures my new arrivals into the population. F is a fecundity vector, so I have F transpose, that's an inner product, if you like, row times column uh, of new individuals per time step. And then I, I put that through some per capita survival prob probability of a new recruit, right? Not all new recruits survive necessarily, but the ones that do are added into the population at the next time step. So, I mean, being completely honest, this is a class of nonlinear models we can treat. So that's one of the reasons we study it, but it also are ecological connections and these have been explored in the literature and so on. What's quite nice in this particular rank one perturbation case is that their asymptotic behavior can be described graphically, which is nice, right? Roughly speaking, these graphs are what determines what these models do. So it's a bit like cobwebbing for difference equations, that sort of idea. The slope of the dotted line is determined by the linear data, A, B and F. And, every, and then the black line is the nonlinear function. Every um, intersection gives you a um, non-zero equilibrium. So if you don't have any intersections, there are no non-zero equilibria. So the figure on the left here is zero globally exponentially stable. The dotted line can be, think of, can be thought of as sort of stasis or renewal. And if you're above that, you're growing. And if you're below that, you're shrinking. So figure B on the right here, at low density, you're growing. And then at high density, you're sort of not growing. <laughs> so then that overall, that gives persistence theorem, right? Um, same model, but now with my assumptions of nonlinear um, F terms. Now it's existential. There is some switching threshold M so that, OK, S is bounded. I find a persistent strategy and I have persistence. My limit is positive. So persistence is guaranteed, provided you pick a switching threshold small enough. If your population can only persist at a certain level, asking it to persist at a higher level is not going to work. That's going to be deemed not a good strategy by your model. So M must be chosen below a persistency threshold, which is a sort of downside of this, because if you don't know that, or how do you choose M? And I just comment here, it does seem as though the choice of M can filter between different persistent strategies. 
So um, the paper that under discussion contains a number of examples based on models from the literature. I just summarise one quickly, a, a female trout cod, uh, seven stage classes. We pick two strategies. One is persistent, one is not. They have the same linear data, ABF, but different nonlinear terms. Oh dear. And you get the following kind of qualitative results, right? So the left hand plot is um, measured abundance and the right hand plot is which strategy. So you see that these light grey dots in the right hand plots, you never change strategy. That's this dotted line. You you go, you have some transient behaviour and then you have an equilibrium. This model admits a non-zero equilibrium. OK, these other two strategies, they well, they change from strategy one to strategy two over time before both settling down on strategy two, which is the persistent strategy in this case. OK, and my solutions wobble around a bit before finding the persistent strategy and converging to the non-zero quantity. So, and all the results we obtained are of that sort of form, right? You know, they illustrate the theorem, I'd say. So, I'm going. I'm sort of wrapping up now. I just want to talk about some of the limitations of this work and sort of possible extensions. So, to be charitable, I would say the transient performance is varied. <laughs> sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. It's hugely dependent on these model parameters. They're, they're not tuned those at all in any sense. And you can sort of see, suppose you have one good strategy and a hundred bad ones. You've got to try all of these a hundred bad ones possibly before you try the one good one. That takes a lot of time. Like you can sort of pathologically break this a little bit. You can also have other peculiarities whereby you switch away from a persistent strategy too early or you stay on a bad strategy for too long, right? And again, ordinarily you, you would switch away. But you're not actually using very much, right? All you're using is the current value of y of t. Yeah, you, uh, that, that, and then so in a sense, the result is quite powerful given it's just it's just using that measured variable and properties of these models, right? Exponential behavior. So you could argue that performance has been traded off against robustness. There are a few other comments I make, right? The model is deterministic. At low population numbers, stochastic effects are more likely to dominate, I think, at least my understanding of kind of ecology. So that would suggest kind of maybe a hybrid model. So sort of Ali effects and so on. So I wouldn't, I'm not trying to propose that at this moment I would take this model to a conservation practitioner and say, here you go, this will solve all your problems. Clearly it needs work and refinement and so on. But I hope that it serves as a starting point for what can be achieved with robust control approaches and at least broadens the academic discussion, you know, looking at the relative merits of optimal versus robust control approaches in conservation. So some possible ways one could improve it is if you just go back to the original model, you can effectively think differently about how S updates itself. So I have this one over Y of T that could be replaced by some function psi. And instead of just looking at what Y does, I could look at what a rolling average of recent Y does. So for example, if I'm oscillating, but I'm broadly speaking, my average is high enough, my mean is high enough. OK, maybe that's persistent. I'm OK with that. Likewise, I could look at the kind of trajectory, right? You know, I might be small, but increasing, I guess, for you increasing. And that would be deemed good. Or I might be high, but decreasing. And again, that would suggest switching off that. And what I expect is that these would give better numerical performance, but proving things would be much harder. Now, depending on what you're interested in, that may or may not be a good thing, right? Like um, probably from a practical point of view, one of these kind of refined models would be better. So just to summarize then, um, I've sought to motivate the use of systems and control theory and theoretical ecology, and theoretical ecology is the source of new maths. I've summarized the results of this switching paper which is a robust control approach to conservation, using feedback control, properties of positive systems and exponential behavior, that's really crucial. Obviously it would need further development before deployment, but hopefully this is the start of a, a dialogue where it could be. Okay, so thank you again once for the invite and um, hopefully I'm roughly on time. Thanks for listening.